Hello and welcome. Welcome everyone. It's so nice to see all of you here. Um, thank you for coming to Barbara Knuth's Visiting Artist Lecture. Although not the 22nd lecture that we've had, this is the 22nd in the North Seattle College Art Gallery's Virtual Visiting Artist Lecture series that we started two years ago. I'm Amanda Knowles, the curator of the NSC Art Gallery and printmaking and drawing instructor at North Seattle College. I'm pleased to work with Karen Stoldreyer, who assists in the gallery, does a lot of work on social media for the gallery, and is assisting behind the scenes here today. We have live transcript available for those of you who want it. Those of you who don't want it or find it distracting, you can turn it off by clicking the live transcript button at the bottom of the Zoom screen and selecting hide subtitle. Use it if you wish, hide it if you wish, but we want to be sure that we have it for those that need it. Uh, First, some acknowledgements, and I will share my screen. First is the land acknowledgement. North Seattle College acknowledges that we occupy the lands of the Coast Salish peoples, the descendants of the first peoples of this region, a people whose cultures endure and are valued. Without this land and these cultures, we would not have access to this gathering, dialogue, and learning space. We take this moment to honor and thank the original caretakers of this land, their ancestors and their descendants who are still here. We encourage participants here today to consider our responsibilities as we stand in solidarity with the sovereignty, cultural heritage and lives of native indigenous and first nations people. Also a labor acknowledgement. We also pause to recognize and acknowledge the labor that created the United States and from which we all benefit. We remember that our nation is built on the labor of enslaved people who were forcibly brought to the US from the African continent. And we recognize the continued contribution of their survivors. We acknowledge immigrant labor and recognize that voluntary forced and prison labor contribute to the building and ongoing maintenance of our nation. We acknowledge all unpaid caregiving labor. Additionally, we acknowledge the critical importance of the work towards racial equity that continues across this country in response to racial injustice and generations of structural racism against BIPOC communities. Um, and then the third slide um, is what we are doing to continue to work to go from acknowledgement to deed. We know that there's not enough just to acknowledge the land and labor and have to be sure that we are taking action. We show you here what actions North Seattle College and the NSC Art Department are taking to support BIPOC individuals and institutions and to be held accountable. We recommend Real Rent Duwamish and we'll put that link in the chat for you to explore. Thank you. This is the last week of the show that is up in the NSC Art Gallery uh, entitled The Sun, the Moon and Stars. The gallery will be open Monday through Thursday, 11 to four through uh, this Thursday, March 3rd. We will be mandating the campus wellness check-in as well as wearing of masks. We will also continue to have virtual visiting artist lectures. We are currently planning two lectures for next quarter. We will continue to work to stick with Monday uh, 12 to 1 p.m time frame for all of these talks. Please stay tuned, checking in with the gallery on Facebook, Instagram, and our website to find out who will be talking and when. We urge you to visit our website for links to recordings of all of the talks to date, as well as the list of upcoming visiting artists. We will post our links in the chat. Thank you. With this, it is time to introduce today's visiting artist, Barbara Knuth. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I will read from her bio. Uh, Barbara Knuth was born and raised in rural Wisconsin, where she grew up working with her hands, making things and enjoying life on the farm. As an adult, she discovered her love for metalsmithing while attending the University of Wisconsin Whitewater, which is where she received her Bachelor of Fine Arts in metalsmithing. Barbara continued on to graduate school at San Diego State University, where she earned a Master's of Fine Arts in metalsmithing. After school, she moved to Seattle to be part of the thriving metals community that is here. Barbara spent the last seven years teaching metalsmithing and jewelry full-time at Auburn uh, Mountain View High School in Auburn, Washington, mm -hmm. where she shared her love of metalsmithing with tons of teenagers. She is now teaching jewelry and metalsmithing here with us at North Seattle College. 
she creates her own work in, in a private studio at her home in South Seattle and shows her work on a regular basis, participating in exhibitions throughout yeah. the United States. Barbara has taught jewelry classes and workshops throughout the area. She received an Emerging Artist Award from the Seattle Metals Guild. She was an artist in residence at the Kranzenberg Arts Center in St. Louis, Missouri. And last month, she was an artist in residence at Aramont School of Crafts. She currently has a ring in an online show called Battle of the Rings hosted by Danica Design and viewers can vote on Instagram for their favorite ring. Barbara, can you um, give us more information on this? Because uh, in looking through it, I had a hard time figuring out where to vote. Okay, and okay. so really you need to follow Danica Design uh, on Instagram. Dana Sara is the one running the show and she's gonna be posting two rings every day, I think for a couple of weeks. And, and it's really easy to vote on your favorite ring. Um, and then it's kind of like a bracket situation. So then the winners, you know, move on the, the people who lose, they're out of the, out of the running. Um, and the final ring can win a $500 prize. So, kind of cool. <laughs> Come vote. <laughs> Very exciting. Yes. Thank you for that. Uh, mm -hmm. And I will go back and, and look through it a little bit more. I will hand you over to Barbara, but before I do, I want to let the audience know that we'll, uh, we will be taking questions in the chat today. So if questions or comments arise during the talk, please write them in the chat and we will hopefully get to all of them. As usual, we will be sending a transcript of the chat to Barbara after the talk. So if you want to comment on the work and her words, please do, but you might be specific about what you're commenting on as she will see your words after the talk. Uh, but I urge you to support her, her ideas, her work in the chat. Welcome virtually <laughs> here. And thank you so much for coming to speak with us, Barbara. Of course. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming. My name is Barbara Knuth, and I'm going to be giving my artist presentation today. Amanda is going to be helping me out by actually showing the presentation. I did a little Zoom date at the school that we didn't get to. So we're, we're going to make it work. So I am a, a metalsmith, a jeweler, an artist, and an educator. Those are all really like important parts of my identity. And as Amanda said, I'm currently part-time faculty at North Seattle College. I am thrilled to be here. I'll talk a little bit more about my journey through this presentation, but I wanna thank you all for coming and thank you so much for having me, North Seattle College and Amanda, thank you for inviting me. So here's just some ways that you can find me. Next slide. My apologies in advance for saying next <laughs> regularly. So I'm gonna talk to you uh, first about my past, where I'm from, uh, which, which for me has a lot to do with why I make the, the art I make and the, the jewelry I make. So this is the house I grew up in in rural Wisconsin. And this of course is in the dead of winter. Uh, but I, I lived in the country, so we had a lot of space. Next slide. And we had got to do all kinds of fun stuff during our childhood. I had lots of room to kind of run around. Um, we got really involved in 4-H. Thanks, Mom. Um, and I learned a lot through that organization. When people ask me what that is, I tell them it's like Boys and Girl Scouts for country kids. Uh, we have regular meetings and there's all different activities you can get into, whether that's music or sports or raising animals or growing vegetables or learning how to sew. And we did all that stuff. And, you know, we would run over to the neighbors and get out our rabbits and do photo shoots in the summertime. Um, this is me and my, my brother, Ben. We were close in age. We were both really interested in animals. So... I know it's hard to tell. It looks like I'm holding like a dozen bunny rabbits in the picture on the right, but I'm holding four. We eventually had up to like 20 some rabbits though. And we had sheep and chickens and all kinds of stuff. So I would call it a hobby farm, uh, but it, it was lots of fun. Next slide, please. And when I was 16, things changed a lot. Life happens and we very suddenly lost my brother. So this has uh, been just weeks, actually, before he passed away. He's 18 and just graduated from college. So you can imagine this just kind of left our family kind of shattered and not really knowing what to do. Next slide. And then when we were still processing that, a year and a half later, when I was just 17, we lost my dad. 
So this ended up having a profound effect on my life. Just like anybody who's ever had to go through something like this, it changes you. It changes the way you look at things. It changes the, the way you think about things. It's everything. It just has a profound change on your life. So I went to college and I started making work about these, this experience, this grief, this trauma, this thing that I couldn't really process, uh, especially like as, you know, now, now having worked with teenagers for a long time, I'm like, oh, I was just a child, you know, like, how do you deal with that kind of stuff? So I was very lucky to like be encouraged to go on to college. And I actually started as a business major, didn't know what I was doing, and eventually found my way into the art department. So this is a piece I did about my dad. So this is a, um, an intaglio print um, and from 2005 uh, that I did of my dad. And this was kind of me starting to make work about this and try to process it. Next slide. So I found the metalsmithing and jewelry studio while I was at college at University of Wisconsin Whitewater. Again, I wasn't like originally planning on it. I didn't really even know what that was, uh, but I started taking art classes and I walked by that metals and jewelry studio and I kept peeking my head in there and I'm like, what are they doing in there? It looks so cool. Uh, I also have to say at the time I was like a big Lord of the Rings fan and I was like, I'm going to cast my own ring of power. That was another kind of motivation for me. But what I think the real thing was that drew me to the metals and jewelry studio is that my dad had been a truck driver who maintained and took care of his truck. So when I saw my dad, he had tools in his hands and he was making things and fixing things. Even the smell of the metal from the shed that he worked in just makes me have nostalgic feelings about the past. And, and I guess in a way made me feel connected to him. Next slide. So after after um, undergrad, I did get my bachelor's of fine arts and metals and jewelry, absolutely fell in love with it um, and just wanted more. And I was really hungry for more. I knew I was just starting to learn about this and just starting to find my voice as an artist. So I decided to go on to graduate school right away. And I ended up moving to San Diego, California. So I got into San Diego State University and packed up my little car and drove across the country with my sister and settled up there for the next three years. Next slide. Moving to California was really awesome experience for me. It was just, I had never like lived outside of the state. It just made me really like grow as a person. And I learned a lot about myself as an artist, what I wanted to do with my career. I, I kind of got my feet wet with teaching in graduate school. I was very lucky to be um, an instructor of record there teaching college level classes and, and getting experience doing that. After I graduated from San Diego State University, I moved from California up to Seattle, Washington. And I was really drawn to this area. I, I, I felt very lost after grad school uh, for anybody who's like gonna be going through something like that or just finishing up a program. It, it really takes a little bit to be like, okay, what am I doing now? And for me, <laughs> I was like, I've been in school since I was five years old. Like, I, what am I going to do? Like, I've been going to school. You know, I went for, straight from high school to college and college to grad school. So I decided to move up to Seattle because it has a thriving metals community. I knew about the Seattle Metals Guild. I knew about jewelers that lived up here. And I knew I was about to lose my community back in, in grad school. So I just felt like I needed to go and kind of start again somewhere else. I was also really drawn to Seattle because my dad, as a truck driver, drove here. So he used to drive all the way across the country and come to kind of Seattle, Kent area um, for business as a truck driver. So it was, again, another connection um, that kind of drew me to this place. I actually moved up here without much of a plan. I had a job interview, um, but I didn't really have a place to live. I had never been here before. I don't recommend that. But I made it work. And actually, the Seattle Metal Guild was amazing. Um, some of those people actually let me couch surf with them for a little bit until I got on my feet. Um, but uh, Seattle has been really good to me. Um, and I'm still here. All right, next slide. So uh, as mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I was teaching. Uh, actually, I'm going to back up a little bit. When I first got to Seattle, you know, there was many years where I was working multiple jobs. So I would 
teach classes at, you know, Danica Design or Prep Fine Arts Center. I was also teaching continuing ed classes here at North Seattle. But I was also, you know, walking dogs or got a job in a factory or worked for other jewelers and artists in the area. Or I also worked in the industry for almost two years. So that's what I did in that gap between arriving to Seattle and then getting this full-time job at Auburn Mountain View High School. So this was a really big deal for me. It was um, a way for me to make enough money from one job uh, to live here. And I taught five jewelry classes a day, Monday through Friday, down in Auburn at Auburn Mountain View High School. And there was up to 28, they were trying to push in 30 kids per class. So every day I was interacting with about 148 kids, teenagers, ages 14 to 18. And it was really an experience. I mean, this is definitely the most challenging like job I had ever had. The kids are going through so much. There's so many of them, you care for them. And so you really kind of get, you know, sucked in. <laughs> um, but they're amazing. I learned so much about myself as a teacher, as of myself as a person, and just really learned how to listen to these young adults and hear them out and, and be there for them. Next slide. So that's what our studio kind of looked like on a daily basis. So like we really had fun. Hard job, but, but I think the kids really liked it. And look at the amazing things that they can make. Um, these are high school kids. So these are the kids who would take the class like four or five times and they would make like a show piece. Next slide. So the, this is like after they've learned some of the basic skills and then they got to design and create something that could actually be shown in an art show. Next slide, good. These are uh, some of my favorite pieces, actually. I think both of these won awards in the show. And I'm just so impressed and proud when I look at these photos. Next slide. Uh, so we used to regularly compete. So this was the last Passing the Torch show we did. Passing the Torch is a high school medals competition that's for the state of Washington. And uh, it was run by the Seattle Medals Guild. It's fallen out of commission simply because we need people to volunteer to run the program. So I actually am hopeful that maybe someday we could revamp it. And if you're a local metalsmith and jeweler um, and you're not involved in the Metals Guild yet and you want to be or you want to volunteer with something like this, there really is a great organization. Our last show was up at the Bellevue Arts Museum. That started to be a regular venue for us. And then we had jurors and a ceremony for the kids. Uh, so it was a really good experience. Next slide. Oh yeah, then it's kind of weird. I'm like, it, things kind of came full circle. So this is actually here at North Seattle. So I loved taking them on field trips, it's a lot of paperwork, but it was fun. Um, and we would come up to Seattle on a big bus. And this was the last field trip I got to go on right before COVID and it was here at North Seattle College. So Lynn Hall is who you're seeing on the right there with the torch. She's doing a cuttlefish casting demo for us. Um, so we got to see that. We went on a little tour of the art classes and the art studios, and she let them pick out like a gemstone that they got to take home with them. And it was just so much fun. Um, and I didn't know that COVID was coming and that a couple years later, I would actually be back here, but as part-time faculty. Next slide. So I'm teaching the jewelry and metalsmithing courses here at North Seattle College right now, which I absolutely love. I have taught classes here before, like a summer course. I subbed for Lynn one time. Uh, I had been involved with CE classes a long time ago, and I just always loved the people who came through the studio, people from all different walks of life, all different age groups, and I, I just really enjoy the community here at this school. So I'm teaching an intro jewelry class every quarter. We're on a quarter system. So these are some of the things we're learning. Fabrication, how to like saw metal, how to connect it together with torches or cold connections, how to set stones. Next slide. These are some more of the projects we've been working on this quarter. Uh, earring projects. We're learning about flush setting and prong setting. Next slide. And next quarter, uh, we have the intro class, of course, but then we also have the small scale metals and hollowware class coming up. So 
that's the the one that's open next quarter and we do still have some spots open if anybody's interested but it's in person you got to be in seattle uh next slide yeah the nsc students are making really beautiful work here um, those are just a couple of photos um, and i've been trying to post things on instagram and our north seattle uh instagram so keep keep an eye on that to see more so now that I've given you an introduction about myself and my career as an artist and a teacher, I'm gonna to talk to you more specifically about my artwork and a couple different bodies of work as well. Next slide. So when I was in graduate school, I started to really kind of focus more on what I wanted to talk about with my art. I kept coming back to those themes of mourning and loss and the ideas of like a memorial so that is what my work was focusing on. And in the beginning, I was like, these pieces are really about the feeling of like anxiety that grief imposes like on your body, like how your chest feels tight or it feels like there's something tangled up in there or uh, you can't like breathe, those kinds of experiences. And this was me trying to make that into a visual form this invisible feeling that's stuck inside of you. Like, what does that look like? Um, so this piece is actually mounted on the wall and those crazy wires hang down. And I mean, it's like, it's probably like six feet like up on the wall. Next slide. Uh, again, I was playing around with this idea of just trying to visually show that feeling that was inside of me. Uh, and I was doing a lot of sculpture at this time too, I just, it was available to me. I was able to just kind of walk down a couple of flights of stairs and go down into the sculpture studio. Um, and I learned how to MIG weld. And this was definitely like, probably like my first like real installation too. Like to me, that this only existed in the gallery. I had to make like a fake wall and draw on it. Um, but I was also trying to focus on having the drawings start to like pop off the wall and then transition into a sculpture. Next slide. So being from the Midwest, I was also referencing um, or, or starting to reference things from the Midwest. So I was looking at silos and other farm equipment. And of course, I kind of grew up in the country. And for me, I was using these, again, as like a metaphor for loss. They're meant to look decayed. And if they're kind of falling apart, um, this vessel is probably three feet tall. So it's pretty big. Um, and I like to experiment with materials, uh, make them look distressed just by, I was experimenting with like chemical patinas and glass enamel. Next slide. And I also worked on this series of yokes. So the yoke is a, again, a piece of farm equipment and it goes around an animal's neck and is meant to help them carry a heavy burden. So this was a really good like image for me to use with with this idea. So this was made in a similar way, like very thin copper that I could actually sew with and crumple and kind of distress it with my hands um, and then tried to give it a kind of a finish that made it look old or something kind of found from a long time ago. Next slide. I also was very interested in playing around with materials like salt and steel and salt in general, I was thinking of it as like, okay, salt is really interesting. Like it, it can preserve things and like save things like food, but combined with the right material, it can be incredibly corrosive and destructive like steel. So I was purposely putting these two things together and letting them do their thing. And you can see in this photo that it's like starting to rust, that sort of thing. But I, um, I, I let it go, you know, like it, it will eat through it all the way eventually and will kind of disintegrate. And the idea behind that is that, you know, hopefully this burden that you carry with you will lessen over time. I like the idea of thinking that it's just kind of kind of fall apart and also has a, a limit to its life, um, just like us. Next slide. Uh, this is just another one of those series. You can see it worn. Uh, this is all steel wire with glass enamel and salt. And there's also little bits of fabric in there from my grandmother's clothing or scraps of fabric I think I had. And I can tell you this piece is, is on its way out. It's hanging in my living room and it's, it's been interesting watching it kind of decay. There's now like 
chunks of it gone. Um, most of it is kind of a steel color instead of this white color. So this was my, my yolk series. And I feel like this kind of uh, shows <laughs> the different materials I was experimenting with. Next slide. So this was some of the larger sculpture that I made. And this was, again, I was in that space of thinking about, you know, the feelings of, of grief. We also started talking about the idea of memorials in one of my art theory classes. And we read some articles and we talked about Maya Lin. And I was so inspired by that. So this is a big sculpture. It's like four feet long, probably like two feet high. And it was a couple hundred pounds by the time I finished it. Um, it's all MIG welded together. And I, I don't, sometimes art precedes itself. It's like you don't really know what it is yet. And then it, you finish it and you have these like aha moments. So it definitely became kind of like a memorial itself or like a gravestone, something like that. I ended up, oh, next slide. I ended up presenting it like this in the gallery. Um, we had kind of a back, back space of the gallery where I was able to put it and make it really dark. Um, I ended up pouring salt all over it and it just, it was very quiet, serene. It looked frozen and it's like, people just kind of knew that like when you go back there, it's like quiet time. <laughs> it was really interesting the way people responded to it. And I thought a lot about like, well, what is a memorial for? Like, what is it supposed to do? What is its job? And I came to the conclusions that this is a, supposed to be a place where you can have permission to feel your emotions. It is a place that is maybe even a, like a receptacle for your sorrow. I kind of like this idea of like leaving it there and then kind of being free of it. So those are the kinds of things I was thinking about. And I loved um, hearing about Maya Lin's making of the Vietnam Memorial. She was so young at the time. Um, and I have one quote that I wanna read to you um, by Maya Lin. So Maya, this is Maya Lin speaking to the concept of the Vietnam Memorial. The rites of mourning, which are more primitive in older cu cultures and were very much a part of life, have been suppressed in our modern times. In the design of the memorial, a fundamental goal was to be honest about death, since we must accept that loss in order to begin to overcome it. The pain of the loss will always be there. It will always hurt, but we must acknowledge the death in order to move on. And I really like this idea of this place giving you permission to feel those feelings. I can definitely recall times of, you know, those emotions bubble up, right? We're only human. And I, I remember feeling resentful of feeling like I couldn't just express that anywhere I wanted to or anytime I wanted to, that it needed to be a certain place or kind of hidden away from others so you don't upset people. Um, so that's kind of something I've, I've thought about a lot. Okay, I'm going to pivot a little bit. Next slide, please. And I'm going to talk about some other work, not so heavy, um, but I'm going to come back to kind of my continuation of that memorial idea. So I want to take some time to talk to you about the other type of jewelry that I design and create. I love making art jewelry or, you know, sculpture that has like a meaning or a concept, but I also enjoy making pieces of jewelry that someone would wear every day. And I, I usually like to design and make things that I like. So I, def I definitely like kind of work within my own style and the things that I make for everyday wear, I will wear uh, also. So this is a series I did that um, it really just, it was simple. I started by like just loving the way shingles overlap and create a texture on a rooftop. And I wanted to incorporate that texture into my jewelry. So this is silver, it's a really tiny, Tendons. It's kind of funny, my everyday jewelry tends to be really teeny and the art jewelry is kind of bigger and um, more sculptural. Next slide. So this is another part of that series. I ended up making, I don't know, 30 some pieces that kind of go with, with this theme. Next slide. Uh, more recently, I've been trying to figure out how to make things faster. So, as much as I loved those little shingled earrings, they were so tedious, like every little shingle I soldered down. So anybody who knows jewelry and metalsmithing, that's pretty nuts. 
So I learned how to draw shapes in Adobe Illustrator and I drew digital shapes. I sent it to this nice guy on Vashon Island and he took that digital file and was able to water jet cut all the shapes for me. So I played around with what shapes I wanted and you know, I definitely had an idea of the designs I was going for, but it was really cool to get this sheet of metal that all you gotta do is like pop out all those little shapes and then you can play around with them um, and come up with all different kinds of designs. So these are copper earrings. I just made these a couple of months ago and these shapes were water jet cut. And then from there, I textured them. I finished the edges. I soldered little mechanisms, um, but I'm really pleased with it. And I feel like this is uh, a new series I'm starting on. And also things like that I wanna share with students too. I feel like it's important to know how to streamline your your process if you're trying to make like production jewelry and make a living off of that. Next slide. I also found myself just being less precious with these parts. Like I, I know I hadn't like labored over them for hours and hours with a jeweler saw. So I was like, oh, let's try this. Let's experiment with that. Like I just, it just made me kind of free up with my designs. So I've also been now powder coating them. Powder coat is a thermal plastic. So I'm able to put that onto the metal and then put it into a little toaster oven for it to set. And I've been layering it and kind of sanding through it. Next slide. And then these are the, the um, my favorite ones that I most recently made, which I'm wearing today. Uh, and again, just so fun to just make something and experiment and come up with some other cool designs. So I do try to do a couple of shows a year. Um, I recently had one here in Seattle at a local shop. I also participated in our school show here at North Seattle. So that's a little bit about the other kind of jewelry that I make. Next slide. Okay, and then I forgot about these two. Uh, these are little teardrop pieces I've been making. So this is another thing, it just keeps kind of creeping back in. My ring that I just made for the Danica design show is in this um, family. So I was thinking about the shingles again and also the teardrop shapes. Morning jewelry is definitely something that I think about a lot, like Victorian morning jewelry, that sort of thing. So that's kind of about it on these pieces is, is I feel like it's like kind of a reference to that and then just playing around with the movement and, and the overlapping of these little shapes. Next slide. And that's a really tiny brooch. It's probably like two inches high. Same with this one, it's probably about two inches big, um, tall. So again, those teardrop shapes. And I like to reference um, or like use sewing in some of my work. It's a way of referencing healing or like a putting of things back together. Next slide. And here is another, this is a ring uh, made out of silver and all those little teardrop shapes kind of swing and move around while you're wearing the ring. All right, next slide. Okay, so the last series I wanna to talk to you about is, I call it my twig series. Um, it's something that I have come back to again and again. Um, and I feel like even for myself, I'm still trying to like figure it out. Next slide. But I've been making things with twigs since about 2009. And I know I'm not the only artist who makes things with twigs. I won't be the first, I won't be the last. But I've been thinking a lot about like why I chose it and like why am I drawn to this? What am I trying to say with this object? So years ago, I just, I started picking them up off the ground and trying to kind of like fix them or encase them or wrap them or like preserve them. I think of the, the, the twig is kind of interesting because it's like it was a part of a tree, like it was alive. And now that it's like detached from the tree, is it nothing or is it dead or what is it? Uh, next slide. So this was, I was still in my salt phase. So there is definitely salt on these things. It's covered with like black paint and black. Um, I was using tool dip. The wires you're seeing are steel. So these have also like disintegrated now <laughs> pretty much. Uh, this is another kind of version of that, but I'm using silver and in the metal smithing and jewelry world, you know, silver is a precious material. So I like the idea of kind of elevating the value of this thing that I found on the ground um, by incorporating it with the silver. 
it also strengthens it and gives it a little more security because these are so fragile. I mean, it, that is a piece of really thin bark that I dipped and tooled it. And then there's a thing of silver inside of it kind of holding it all together. Next slide. More just like armoring the outsides of these things. So this is actually like a little log that I took steel mesh and pinned it down over it and kind of covered it as a way of to, to kind of preserve it or armor it. Next slide. And then I started casting some of these twigs. So this is a brooch. It's about three inches wide and about two inches tall and it's wearable. You can put it, put it on and carry it around with you. And I was becoming more interested in the idea of casting the twigs. Uh, I think about it in, in relationship to memory and like how memory works. You know, you're trying to remember a person who's no longer here, but it feels like you can never really get to the real thing. The memory of them or the memories that you're remembering, it's not the same. It might remind you of them or feel good, but it's never the same of like having that person there again. So by taking that twig and I, you do, the process is lost wax casting. So you put a mold around it um, with this material called investment. You burn out the original. So the, the twig went away and then I replaced that cavity with mol melted metal. So what you end up with is a copy of that thing. So it kind of looks like the real thing kind of feels like it, but it's not. And I also have the salty string on here. So I had all kinds of fun salt experiments happening in my home for a while and learned how to like grow it onto strings. Again, just referencing this effort to preserve something. Next slide. So I've got quite a few of these. Here's another little brooch, probably about uh, two and a half inches high, um, about an inch wide. And those are just regular twigs that were painted and then stitched together. I think of it as like an urge or a need to try to like put things back or fix the things that kind of fell apart, but it's a, it's a futile attempt. Um, there's really nothing to be done. And then I, I use the picture frame again as a reference to memory. Uh, when you see picture frames in people's homes, there's often photographs of your family in those frames hanging along the wall. So, which is another great way to remember someone or to memorialize them is like with an actual photograph that really does like transport you to that place. So that's the reference with the frame. Next slide. Uh, another little twig brooch, it's about two and a half inches high. And these guys are just tied together with a little bracket holding onto them. And then there's a pin back that you can um, put it onto your shirt. Next slide. And again, a cast twig. So kind of looks like the original thing, but it's not. Uh, the fabric on this one is actually a little piece of fabric from my dad's shirt. And it's been dipped in wax and salt and kind of haphazardly sewn. Again, this way of trying to like fix and save. It's kind of influenced by this fear of forgetting. I feel like I get this like I'm fearful that I'm gonna like forget about these people. And so this is like the, the attempt of like holding on. Um, and I also really love the fact that these can be worn and carried with you through your life um, as like a little portable memorial. Next slide. So this is not one of the twig pieces, but I feel like it it's very much related to the things I'm thinking about in that twig piece and does a good job like talking about uh, the idea of memorializing something. So this is a necklace that I made for a specific show. We were uh, invited to make a piece of jewelry with the wood from a boat, this old maritime vessel in Seattle that was out of commission. Um, they had to take it all apart, just couldn't be on the water anymore. But it was kind of like a historic vessel. And so they took the pieces of wood and invited jewelers to make piece of jewelry with the wood from the Wawona ship. And could you go to the next slide? I have an in progress photo. So I'm also gonna explain electroforming. Um, I've mentioned that a couple of times during my presentation. So electroforming is uh, making a metal matrix over something that is not made of metal. 
A common thing that you might know of is bronze baby shoes was a big tradition for a long time. And it's meant to preserve and save something that's precious to you. And it's now stronger because it's encased in metal. So I've used electroforming in that way to kind of reference that. Um, I also really like the look of it. So this is the piece in progress. So I took the little square of wood from the Wawona and I chopped it up into little sticks. Um, I made a metal form, glued the sticks onto that. And then the part that you don't see is I painted copper conductive paint over it. And then it goes into an acid bath and it uses electricity to coat the piece in metal ions. It's almost as if the metal's like growing over the piece. And could you go back one slide so we can just see it one more time? So that's what happened over that wood. And I actually left the wood in there. Sometimes I burn it out, but I decided to leave it in there. I just dried it out really well. And I like the idea that it's still in there. Like the Wawona is like in that necklace and will be preserved in there now for much longer. Uh, next slide. And then actually go to the other, no, keep going. One more, great. Um, and then this is the other piece that I made um, with the Wawona. So again, I was using, I have these like picture frames, these wax frames that I was electroforming and then I combined that with the wood. And this one's quite small, just a little brooch. And next slide. All right, so back to twigs. So. Um, as Amanda mentioned earlier, I was very lucky to go to Aramont School of Crafts recently in Tennessee, and I did a week-long artist residency there. Uh, the event was called Pentaculum, and it was a dream. I just got to work in the studio like 13 hours a day, work with other jewelers, and I brought a bunch of partly finished twig jewelry. So it was the perfect opportunity to sit down and make more of these things. So um, this was a little sample that I had made a, a long time ago and it just wasn't finished. It just only existed as a little twig. So I'm actually wearing this one, but this one I finally finished it up and turned it into a real brooch. So I had to create the backing for it and, and do some other work. Next slide. Um, this is another new piece. These last ones are the new things. So I brought some cast twigs along with me and decided to um, make a pendant with them. Um, at the end, I sewed it together with some black thread. Again, it's like, the, I kind of like this idea that it's like, oh, you're gonna like try to fix that, but like you kind of can't. Like um, the, the thread is so fragile that is, is being put through the metal. So I really like thinking about these things being small and wearable. The idea that they're portable and um, that they're also supposed to be like a memorial really intrigues me because when I was talking about memorial earlier, I was saying, you know, it's, it's something that I feel gives you permission to like feel those emotions and those feelings. And, and it, it's really not acceptable to feel those feelings like just anywhere in society. Like it, it is appropriate to like go to the right place to feel those feelings. And I like the idea that you carry this with you. So you, it's a portable memorial and it's a thing that can give you that permission to feel those feelings anytime. And, and you carry it with you instead of it being a big place that you go to. So next slide. That's really what I've been thinking about with these pieces, that they are these little portable memorials. And this was the piece I was really excited about making at Aramont, because for me, it's like the combination of the electroforming and the twig stuff and the shingles. Like I'm still obsessed with the whole shingle thing. So uh, this is an electroform twig. The twig is gone. It's been burned out. So it's just that copper matrix that I kind of grew over the twig. It's hollow inside, so it's actually really lightweight. And then I just started um, layering those shingles over it as a way to make it seem like armor, or again, this idea of trying to preserve this thing that's like no longer with us. I think that's all I got for, <laughs> for the talk about my art. I am going to take some time to answer questions. So, and I also wanna thank everyone for coming. If you like have to jet or, or something like that, thank you so much for being here. I also wanna be really, um...
uh, careful about your time because I know that you're heading to class in just 10 minutes. <laughs> so uh, I will ask some questions. The first question is, uh, what is Victorian mourning jewelry? Oh, um, when Queen Victoria was ruling in England many, 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 many moons ago, she had lost her husband and she went into a state of mourning for many years. I think it was even beyond the like regular two years. And she ordered everybody else to also wear black jewelry in mourning. So she was in mourning over her husband and wore all this like black jewelry. Like you weren't supposed to have like glittery gems and it wasn't, it was supposed to be dark and somber. Um, and there's also like, so a lot of black was used in hair. Yes, there was the mourning jewelry with hair. And I actually like, I found a museum in Madison, Wisconsin, where I got to go look at that and touch it and everything. I definitely recommend looking that up if you're curious. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. A yeah. uh, lot of really good uh, uh, comments are happening in here. Um, one, I'm just going to read one or, or two, but I, I love the idea of jewelry that potentially disintegrates as well. I know that most of the stuff that you are making doesn't necessarily disintegrate, but there was the, you know, salt on the rope and how that kind of works. So I did that for a while and I'm, I'm still really interested in that as like an art idea. So Emma um, says I love the idea of jewelry that disintegrates. Often a jewelry piece kind of marks a phase in one's life. To have it literally unmake itself is like a nudge that you're always allowed to move forward into new phases of your life. Oh so Ooh, I love that. good. That's good. Yeah and again like it's a you know this is about really like heavy feelings of grief and loss. It's like, it's, it's reassuring to know you can let that go, right? And, and be free of it. It's a great observation. Yeah. Karen says, this, is, this talk is giving me so many new and valuable ways to think about jewelry, which I'm so appreciating. I love this idea of carrying the memorial with you. And I love too, this idea of jewelry devolving and letting go um, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, uh, and it changing the, the phase of life that it represents and goes forward. It's interesting because, um, you know, jewelry can be so many things, right? Like we know that it can be decorative, but um, it can also be talismanic. It can be so many other things. Um, the thing that came to mind when you were talking about, you know, having a portable memorial is everybody always comments on jewelry, right? Like, how do you deal with that? That, you know, it's, it's okay, it allows you to have this feeling, but also when someone compliments, what is the, what is your response? What is, how does that work? Like if people compliment me on my jewelry? Yeah, and it's, and it is one of those pieces that is, you know. It about. might depend on the day <laughs> like I feel because like it's you know it's double coated a little bit and that I can talk about it being like a sad and beautiful object yeah. without maybe saying the whole story right. um so honestly I would it would kind of like what's the context and and what are what is our discussion about and that sort of thing so I actually sometimes I'm quite private about that stuff because it is personal it's hard you have to kind of be vulnerable to talk about it so yeah, it's not always easy and I'm not always up for it. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, Clinton asks, do you use your art to accept your emo emotions? I do, absolutely. I don't, I don't know how other people would feel about this, but I actually feel like that, that art jewelry that I make is, is mostly for me. Like I, it, it helps me like to express myself and I get joy of like seeing the final product and uh, along with that, I do like using it as a tool for other people to feel permission to feel those feelings or to feel like, oh, you're, I'm not alone. Like you felt like that too. I've been through something like that too. Uh, I do enjoy it for that. Um, but yeah, absolutely. It, it's, it's been so therapeutic for me. I feel so lucky that I found art as like an outlet and it's a healthy outlet, you know, and there's other ways people deal with their pain, right? So I feel very lucky to have art um, as something I can use to express my feelings. And there's so much labor in it too, right? So the labor is sort of a portion of that 
um, of that morning in, in some absolutely. respect. Absolutely. Like I very on purpose um, had done a lot of pieces that were laborious stitching, twisting, tying of things. And it was a meditation about those feelings um, and trying to kind of work through it as I was moving my hands. Absolutely. Big part of it. And the repetition of things kind of can also reference like a passing of time, which kind of has to do with the work. So perfect. Are there other questions that you didn't get into the chat that you might want to say live and in person? Oh yeah, um, the drawings. Um, Kelda talks about the drawings um, on the floor oh. and all of that, and how it's it's really a, a beautiful it's beautiful to have seen those and to kind of get a context, you know, a little bit more of the like greater context of everything. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, I know you have places to be. <laughs> yeah, so I do have a class starting in four minutes, so I guess I should go. Thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you for I'm talking sure. to us. Thank you for sharing all of that with us. So perfect. Yay.